Thank you for the invitation. Um, yeah, so we're going to move a bit further east. Uh, we heard about Ukraine, and now we're going to hear about uh, a case, a country that I think provided a roadmap for many of the reforms that took place in Ukraine. Um, so I'm no longer based in Georgia, but I worked there from 2009 to 2014. I worked with Transparency International Georgia, and now I'm uh, in Vienna trying to export Georgian reforms to Austria, which is uh, a tricky uh, um, project. Um, but as you see, Georgia is in a region that is not known for government transparency. Um, it has Russia in the north, Turkey, Armenia, and Azerbaijan. Um, and it, as late as 2003, Georgia was considered by many basically a failed state. Uh, it had, uh, uh, the state was falling apart, there was very little functioning infrastructure, uh, the public sector was endemically corrupt. Um, and like in Ukraine, uh, a few years later, there was a, a peaceful revolution, the so-called Rose Revolution in 2003, 2004, and a new government came into power and made it its priority to rebuild the state from the ground up. Uh, and they were actually really successful in implementing a number of uh, anti-corruption reforms. Um, they are considered one of the biggest success stories worldwide in the past 20, 30 years. Um, and uh, they introduced a very high level of transparency in, in, in many different areas of the public sector. Um, I first uh, got into touch with the issue of procurement when I filed a freedom of information request in 2010 and we tried to figure out um, how much the renovation of the city hall in the capital Tbilisi had cost and the city hall wouldn't tell us. And then we asked the procurement agency and they said, we don't know, uh, but you can stop by at our office and look for the contract yourself. And when we came, we saw that. Um, and these were the government contracts just stored in the procurement agency uh, in the year 2010. And that was actually the year when Georgia still had a Soviet-style, very bureaucratic, very uh, difficult, slow uh, procurement process. But at that time, there was a head of the procurement agency, and he wanted to completely reform and redo the procurement uh, system. And they did that in a very quick and radical way um, within uh, basically uh, half a year. They, they designed a, an e-procurement system and moved everything online. Um, they, so in, in 2011, they launched this. And from that point on, all the government contracts were only tendered online. Uh, nothing was done on paper anymore. Um, and they adopted what we heard also from Ukraine, this idea of radical transparency, that everybody should be able to see everything. Um, because the reasoning was the, the corruption problem was so big in the past that it was really worth taking the risk of moving everything into the openness, uh, even if that would you know, be an, an, an unknown territory because the EU and other actors were saying, wait, 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 you know, this is not how we do it in Europe, um, but Georgia did it anyway. Um, and so now uh, about 4,400 procurement bodies are uh, buying everything they need online. Um, and as in Ukraine, all the documentation and all the tenders can be accessed on a central platform by everybody. Um, you can see all the bids, and as we uh, discussed before, uh, which is a an, an really interesting thing. You can also see the companies that didn't win the tender and their bids. Um, and uh, you can um, ask, uh, you, there's a Q&A possibility on the procurement side. So if a company, a potential bidder, uh, has questions, you can see that the question is asked and you can see how it is uh, answered. Um, there's a, a publicly accessible blacklist of companies that performed poorly in the past. You can see which agency complained about what company re, re, in connection to what tender. You can see which companies are whitelisted so that it's easier for them to participate because they have a, a good track record. Um, and one thing that also uh, touches upon what was discussed before is everybody can stop a tender by filing a very easy online complaint. So basically you have on the, on the procurement platform you have a form and here you just need to pick the article of the procurement law that you think is violated by a specific tender and you argue why 
uh, and that stops the, the tender process and within 10 days a commission reviews the complaint and the complaint including the name of the person who complained and the reasoning of the commission is published online. So you see everything about the complaints as well. So it's not a whistleblower mechanism because it's clear who, who filed the complaint. But um, this has actually been a mechanism that appeared to really help build trust in the system. So before this online uh, 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 complaint mechanism existed, uh, very few companies complained because they thought it was only destroying future opportunities for them to win a tender if they complain about irregularities. But uh, I took it, and at Transparency International we took it, as an indication that more and more companies believed that it, it's, it's useful to file a complaint and that uh, it can have a positive impact. Um, so before I show you some of the, uh, some of the website and, and another portal that uses the procurement data, um, some of the impact. So the World Bank in 2000, for the year 2011 to 2015 uh, estimated the gains for Georgia f to $400 million. Uh, the introduction of the platform cost half a million dollars to a million dollars. So the return on investment is massive. If we manage to do really transparent public procurement, the World Bank has estimates that between 10 and 20% of the procurement value, volume can be saved due to efficiency gains. Your are experts, maybe that's a very optimistic ap approach, but in any case, there's a lot of money at stake that could be saved by increasing more, uh, by increasing the transparency. Um, another indicator that, that uh, the, the system is, is working is that there's slow growth in the number of average bidders uh, for each tender. And as I mentioned, a uh, lot more companies and also civil society actors are filing complaints against tenders. Um, so I'm not sure, yeah, you cannot see very much, but this is, a, uh, this is, um, this is the front page of a, of a tender that was actually won by a Spanish company, that's why I picked it. It was about training uh, air traffic controllers. Um, and you would see basically the metadata. Um, uh, what, what the government wants to buy and, and uh, the dates and the time frame and so on. And here you would see the tender documents. You see there's two old tender documents that are canceled out because they're no longer valid. So they were amended, but you can always access the, the documents that are no longer valid and the new ones. So you can see what was changed. Uh, nothing can be deleted, basically. And here, this is a question here. A French state-owned company asked, you know, if they have to translate documents and the procurement agency said, yes, uh, you have to. Um, this would be anonymized during the bidding process, but still everybody would have access to the same information. Um, then on the next page, you would see the different bids submitted by the four companies that bid on this contract. And then down here, which is cut off, you would see the, the final bidding round and the winning company. And here you would see all the documents that the winning company submitted, um, all the technical documentation, everything. Here you would see the contract that was first signed, and then here you would see a correction to the contract, and here an amendment to the contract. Um, because it's not only really important to publish the original contract that was signed, but a lot of corruption can happen after the contract was signed because you then increase the price or you reduce the deliverables or, or make other changes. Um, so Georgia not only publishes all the tenders, but all the receipts of all state institutions. So this is, for example, the database. Uh, this is also on the central portal. And here I have all the receipts filed recently by the uh, Georgian embassy here in Spain. And these are their restaurant receipts. Um, and so, for example, uh, you could look at the metadata of one restaurant receipt. Uh, and here you have the scanned receipt. Um, and so this is, this is an embassy, so this is diplomatic service. So some countries would argue this is national security and some, you know. Um, but uh, by and large in Georgia, this information is uh, made public. There are some, um, some, some things that are not published and we don't actually quite know what is not published. Um, but a lot of the kind of uh, police actors, um, domestic security stuff, that is not published. Um, and here you would see, for example, the procurement plan of the, the Georgian embassy in Spain. So you would have, uh, for this year, 45 different 
types of goods and services that they have budgeted for. Uh, and here you would see they budgeted 35,000 lari, which is like 10, 12,000 euros, just for food and restaurant stuff. Um, so you could look at, uh, for example, how much are they spending on food? And this is actually something that um, we realized is more easy to have a discussion about in public. Is not the road project because nobody understands if, should, if it should be 300 million euros or 400 or 500. These are values that nobody really understands. But what in some cases really got a public debate about government spending going was restaurant uh, receipts uh, from public officials and when they would cater, when they would bring in a World Bank delegation and they would spend basically uh, two months of an average household income on restaurants. Uh, food for, for each attendant of the reception, that would be something that people got really angry about because that's something that is more relatable than a big infrastructure project. Um, so while the government portal really provides a breakdown of all the detailed data, it doesn't give you a big picture. And so that's why um, we launched a tender monitor at the time. Um, it's basically a, a, a system that has to scrape all the data from the government portal and aggregates it and makes it a bit more user-friendly to search. Um, and there's also different uh, platforms that link to this data. So here's a, um, a platform that TI launched a couple of years ago. It's about all the donations to political parties. Um, and I'm gonna come back to that in a second. And here is a company registry that TI Georgia scraped. So the official Georgian company registry, you could only search by a company name or a company ID. But TI basically took all the data and made it publicly accessible and searchable so that you could search, for example, for a name or an address and really try to identify um, who, who controls which company. So when you want to check and verify uh, asset disclosure of public officials, for example, you need to be able to search by their names to find if, they're, if they officially own a company that they didn't declare on their asset de to declaration form. Um, you could look on this platform, for example, uh, there's a profile of each public body. You could see how many average bidders, for example, do they get. Um, and further down, you would have a more detailed information on what types of goods and services they buy and which the, their most important uh, suppliers are. Um, and as was also mentioned before here, this is a company profile. This is, again, the Spanish company that only participated in this one contract. Um, but you would see which are the major competitors based on the other companies that participated in the tenders this company participated in. So here it's three other foreign companies that want to also train the, the, uh, the air traffic controllers. But with this data, you could really do a more sophisticated uh, competition analysis, find out which sectors are more competitive, and maybe identify cartels, um, if there are any. Um, as I mentioned, this is a platform that links to it. It has the, the information on the donors to the political parties. And this, is, for example, shows the ruling party, and you see the big the companies and people who donated. Um, and if you would click on the, on the, bit, on one, on the biggest donor here, um, you would here see that this company participated in six uh, tenders. And you could immediately jump to the, to the procurement portal and find out more about the tenders and if you can identify anything that would suggest uh, something problematic or cured. Um, one thing that we did is uh, in 2011, we looked at all the government contracts that were directly awarded to companies without a tender. So single source contracts and we took the data from the company registry, from the the party donations and from the asset disclosure of public officials. And we tried to identify if, uh, if public officials did not disclose companies they owned or their spouse owned, um, but we could find through the company registry. And we, we tried to identify cases, of course, of potential corruption where an official uh, who works at a specific public body would control or have links to a company and that body would give a contract to that company that official controlled. Um, but also to see if there are any patterns between uh, uh, directly awarded contracts without a tender, so single source contracts, and donations to the ruling party. Um, 
so we looked at 430,000 single sourced uh, contracts from the first two years the data was available in 2011, 2012. Um, and when we mapped it by months, we saw that kind of the, the, the volume of contracts that were awarded without a tender was going up. And here we had pr uh, parliamentary elections. So it was going up right until the months before the election. And there's different possible explanations. One is, um, these are, this line here is construction contracts. So there's, there shouldn't be really an excuse to not tender a lot of construction contracts. But at the same time, what construction contracts do is they create one employment, short-term employment, and the other, they create a, a public impression that something's going on, right? There's, the, there's new projects coming up. There's, uh, you, people see that the country is changing and that can have an impact potentially on how people vote uh, and can support the, the ruling party or the government. Um, but what we also saw is in the metadata, it showed why was this contract not tendered? And we saw that basically it was almost the same curve. Um, the green line was because the president or the government allowed uh, for an exception in this case not to tender. Uh, so at this time, the Georgian procurement law allowed that if the government or the president decreed that no tender was necessary, you wouldn't have to do a tender. Um, so basically, this was politically motivated that uh, government contracts were just pushed out the door and not tendered. Um, and when we looked at, okay, which companies won these contracts and who are the people that are the managers and... Uh, and the owners, and did they donate to the ruling party? We found a lot of patterns of people donating to the ruling party just around the time they, their company got this uh, single source contract. And um, basically, uh, we found that, uh, that, that, that some three million euros in donations to the ruling party ahead of this parliamentary election, which is quite, it was 60% uh, percent of the donations there. So it's, the, the number might be not very high, but it, the percentage was, was quite significant. Um, came from the owners or directors of companies that had received single source contracts in the same year. Um, and the contracts they had received amounted to 72 million euros. So it was about 4% of the contract value that they happened to donate to the ruling party on average. Um, then we looked at the fall, after we published this in, in 2013, um, we didn't find that the government who came into power had the same pattern in the very beginning. We didn't find any, any significant correlation between do donations and, and single source contracts. But then my colleagues in Georgia in recent years looked at uh, what has happened in the past two years, and it's basically the same pattern all over again. Um, it's, uh, people donate to the ruling party who happen to own or manage companies that receive single source contracts. And there might be other explanations. It's not only about corruption and conflicts of interests. It's also because high level officials and especially members of parliament happen to be businessmen and they happen to own companies that get a lot of government contracts as well and they support their own party. That's one explanation as well. But still there is this concerning um, connection between uh, government procurement and, um, and, and, and party donations. Um, just to add, because we had the discussion before, how we could do this kind of analysis is because Georgia uses sing, uh, unique IDs for all the people. Um, in Georgia, a lot of people have the same name, uh, first, uh, first name and last name. So it's, it's, it's completely accepted that the ID card number is used as a unique identifier. And that allows us to link data from the company registry and the, the party donations and so on, um, which you wouldn't be able to do in, in many other countries. Um, and this is the, the very last slide. Um, this was one exercise where we brought really the, the data together from the land registry, which is open, from the company registry, which is open, from the procurement data, uh, the party donations. And this guy, Bitsina Ivanishvili, he's the richest man in the country and served as the prime minister uh, from, uh, for, for one and a half years. And when he was prime minister, the Ministry of Interior bought some, something from a company he controlled but he didn't control it on paper and he hadn't disclosed uh, the ownership of, of his company network in his asset disclosure. But 
because uh, he, had, he had a very prominent villa uh, uh, in the center of town. And we looked at the land registry and we found that the helipad of the villa was owned by a different company than owned the property that his house was built on. And so we were able to figure out that these companies must all be controlled by him because he's a billionaire and you would assume that he controls the, the, the land that his own villa is built on, just like in the case of Yanukovych. Um, and some of these companies were in Belize, in the British Virgin Islands, but we were able to really map the kind of a, this is a small map of a money flow that was not very significant, but it connected to the prime minister. And it, it was uh, good evidence that he controlled uh, offshore shell companies that he hadn't disclosed officially. And that would later come out in the, uh, in the, in the Paradise Papers and so on. OK, thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, so one of the more challenging reforms, other than procurement and many others, was that basically all the policemen in Georgia were fully corrupt. Uh, and you could buy a post in the police for about $10,000, and then you would get a uniform, but not a salary, but you would have a license to collect bribes, basically. Um, and so nobody trusted the police. And what the government uh, did soon after coming to power in 2004 is they would fire all the policemen in the country basically in the same week. Uh, and the country wouldn't have a police force uh, for uh, a few weeks. And they trained new police. And they gave them this oligarch, actually. He uh, put in a lot of cash. And he, they bought new police cars, new uniforms. They rebranded the police. They trained new young people. Um, and they really tried to establish yeah, a credible police force. But what they also did is they bugged uh, many of the police cars uh, without the policemen knowing. And they had a special force that would basically undercover offer bribe to, uh, bribes to policemen. And uh, if police would like sit in the car and like talk about the money they just accepted or do something other, uh, something else dodgy, um, and like they would have body cams to document everything. Basically, the government, if they catch corrupt police, they would drag them in front of national TV cameras the same night and say, these are Dato and Georgi, and they are part of the new police, and they took a bribe, and they're going away for 10 years. And so it was not the fully rule of law approach, but it was effective. <laughs> but they would basically send a very strong message that uh, corruption on this level was not acceptable anymore. And, and it really helped to, to establish credibility within a, a few months or a few years. So I know it's not going to be but I, I agree. I thought it was such a crazy story and uh, extreme circumstances and stuff. So anyway, so after this interruption by the uh, new moderator, uh, <laughs> so we have time for one or two questions before the next uh, slides. So anyone? Ukraine. Ukraine is about the same size as Spain, 
that would be silly and suddenly had 200 people working on your project. Tomorrow you could do a lot more, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, so I don't know to what extent we can analyze what is, what is it is it the political will? Is or maybe it's a combination of these things, but to break down the elements, how much depends on the political will? How much depends on the um, the capacity of civil society to demand and work on these changes? I just wonder what you think, or any other elements you mm -hmm. can um, I think a fair amount was um, that uh, the government at the time took in a lot of new people who didn't have a political career or a public service, civil service career before. And so they got a lot of people who wanted to make something happen and they were not connected w within this area already. Uh, some element was international pressure. The international community wanted to see reforms. I believe... Uh, one of the many angles of political interest connected to such a reform is that a central government can more easily control uh, what's happening on the local level. So if you have this level of transparency and a centralized government, you, you can more closely monitor what your local people are doing. And, and I believe that was possibly one of the motivations as well. Um, I think when Georgia did a lot of these reforms, they realized that it just got them a lot further. Georgia doesn't have any resources or, or other things they, they, they can make money off, and so they realized that a, having a good business environment and an attractive uh, place to live uh, is, is really valuable. And I believe that these kind of reforms really were a driving force uh, to get also foreign investment into the country and to get the banking system uh, uh, stabilized and so on. Um, yeah, but I don't, I don't know the, the recipe, but I would actually say that, that a lot of the reforms were driven more by the government and that civil society had kind of small contributions and highlighted important issues and then the government would ex be open to discussing them and accepting them. Um, it was also a lot of dialogue because often civil society criticizes something and then the government can explain you why something happened and you can maybe find a way to, to still improve the whole system. Um, yeah, but I, I, I think what, what was really crucial was an openness from, from certain government actors to say, okay, I'm actually looking for uh, useful suggestions and input. Um, actually, we had this case that the head of the procurement agency came to us and said, how should we better design our bidding processes? Like, I don't know. and like. I need experts, I need people who can tell me who have done these things. Um, and I think that's, if we can find this kind of partnership between public officials, politicians, and civil society who really wants to move forward in a very constructive manner and that has expertise to offer, then hopefully we can, we can make things happen. So thank you, Matthias. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot.